whether you're in the room with us or whether you're joining us on the live stream, please stand for our first song. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Amen. Please be seated. Hello. Um, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here this morning, whether you are in person or online. Um, and if you are visiting with us today in the little thingy under the chairs in front of you, there's a plastic bin. <laughs> a tray, thank you. Um, there's a plastic bin and you can find a visitor information card. And we would love to get to know you and talk with you. And if you fill that out, we will also give you a Tri-Valley mug. Um, so if you fill one of those out, you can give those to Jacob. He's standing in the back. He'll be up here. Um, and he will trade you for a mug. Um, I have a couple announcements. So the first one is if you would like to volunteer in the nursery for the next two months, our very own Lorelai Eckert is running the nursery, and she needs a TA. Um, so if you would like to TA for her, you can talk to Ryan or Sarah Gibson, and they will get you connected with Lorelai. The second thing is, uh, next week is dinner and Devo. So the last Wednesday of each month, we have a dinner and devotional in the Family Life Center, the other building, um, from 6.30 to 8. So come hungry, because we will provide some kind of food. Um, so yesterday, if you were not aware, we had a work day down at Daybreak Camp um, in Santa Cruz, and I just want to say thank you to everybody who came out and helped, and a really big thank you to Kelly Mackey for organizing this and uh, getting our group down there to rake some leaves and pick up sticks. <laughs> um, <laughs> ask Rick about how how we felt. <laughs> um, at Tri-Valley, we are a giving church, and if you would like to give, there are three ways that you can do that. You can um, turn in a check or money to the offering box in the back. You can mail in a check to the church, or you can give online. So thank you again for being here, and let's worship together. After this song, uh, Rachel McGrandall has a scripture reading for us. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord 
forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sees them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Amen. After this song, Greg Brown will lead us in prayer. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Pray with me, please, and you'll know what that means in just a moment. Father, glory, honor, and dominion are yours. Praise be to you this morning, Lord, for redeeming us. Together, we as your church say, hallelujah, Lord. Together, as your church, Lord, we say, hallelujah, Lord. We exalt your name this morning, Lord, the name that is above every name in heaven and on earth. You are our king, and we rejoice this morning in your holy name. We exalt you, Lord. You and you alone reign over your creation, and we praise you for your faithfulness to all of us and to your world. And 
inhabit our praises this morning, Lord. As your servants, we sing with our hearts, we raise our voices, and we pray that you inhabit those and that you are pleased. We know there is no one else like you, Lord. And so we exalt you this morning. We praise you through the name of your son, Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. All right. After this song, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God.
Good morning. For those of you that don't recognize me, my name is Wade Skinner, and you probably don't because this is the first time I've stepped foot in the building. And before I sit down and partake in the Lord's Supper, I, I do want to selfishly take this moment to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of myself and my wife to this entire congregation for the prayers, for the, the heartfelt interactions. Um, it's beyond words. So, thank you. Um, here in a bit, Jacob is going to talk about swapping stories. And I think when I look at the, uh, the table and what it represents, um, I think about home as well. And I think about the opportunity we always had to sit down as a family growing up and swap stories, either stories of the day or stories that were going on around us. Um, and it was a joy. And it was uh, something that always brought us together as a family. And I don't think it's without um, purpose that God put us at the table together to always remember, remember him, remember each other. And uh, I'm so very thankful for this opportunity to partake in communion with each of you. Uh, and as I prayed on it this week um, and prayed over and over for the right things to say, uh, the message kept coming back that it's not about me. It isn't about me at all. It isn't about the perfect things to say. It isn't about what we do within reason at all. It's absolutely about him. It's about his sacrifice. And as we look at the parallels between the Passover and the table and the communion and the lamb without blemish and the blood across the doors and the blood that was shed on the cross, we are reminded of this redemption story and the sacrifice that God made. So what I'd like to do is pray for the cup, pray for the bread, um, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Um, so please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly and Most Gracious Father, God is uh, without, uh, I'm without words to express my gratitude and my thanks. And on behalf of all of us, we thank you for your sacrifice, your body that was broken, your blood that was shed. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we come together each week uh, to celebrate, to worship, to take this bread and this cup, um, we do so under this roof with representation uh, from Jacob. And in so many ways, um, we're blessed by what is here, but it does uh, only come through the grace of God. And um, we have an opportunity to give back that which was afforded to us, uh, we have the opportunity to share, and uh, we're called to give, and I would like to pray for that offering and, uh, and ask you to search your heart and to um, give as you're able. So please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, 
we're so thankful for all that you have provided us. We're so thankful for the many blessings in our life. We're thankful for uh, this church. We are thankful for this building to worship with. And we are thankful for uh, the um, outreach that happens through uh, this church and the body. And uh, Father, we pray that uh, whatever it is that we are able to offer you, uh, we know that you will be able to multiply that many, many fold. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Wade. Can we show some love for Wade? And Sylvia, watching online with us this morning, we have uh, such a cool, uh, I love how we've gotten to know each other. They moved here from out of town uh, a year and a half ago, right? Almost two years, coming up on two years, it doesn't matter, uh, a while ago. And they've been worshiping with us online, and we've been praying for them and their families, and, uh, but minimal in-person interaction. I was so excited for this Sunday when I heard Wade was going to be in the building and sitting, joining us in our communion table. It's just a, a testament to what, what God can do in work in ways that I wouldn't have expected or projected. But anyway, I'm very excited that you're here. I appreciate you leading us. I uh, love the focus on Jesus, and I just love breaking bread, drinking the cup. It's a, it's a wonderful weekly reminder. It's a story that we don't want to forget. It's a story that we will continue to tell. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, I want to, at this time, dismiss our children to head over to Kids Worship, the program we have for kids ages 4 through 5th grade over in the next building. Thank you to our volunteers, our teachers who put in time prepping for that and loving our kids, teaching them about the Lord. And if you have a child that's under the age of 4, you are welcome to take them over to the nursery located in this building right across from the bathrooms uh, for their Bible lesson, kids songs, lots of playtime. It's a good scene over there. I want to invite all of the rest of you that this coming Wednesday evening, you're invited to the building. We're going to have our monthly dinner and Devo. That's going to be exciting. We're going to send out an email early part of this week letting you know what our food theme is. Spoiler, I think it's going to be tacos. And uh, we're going to ask you guys to bring some sides. As always, you're welcome to bring you know, a dessert or a side to go with that. But it's just an excuse to get together, sit around the table, Swap stories, connect with each other. Sounds good, right? Sing song. Yeah, there's, there's worship. There's a, there's a Bible lesson. It's just it's good, good church. And I uh, hope you guys can make it. That's this coming Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, right here in the Family Life Center. Last week, we've been on a journey through the book of Exodus. And uh, we've seen the ten plagues. We've seen Pharaoh saying, finally, go. get You can, you can take your people and go out to the wilderness but then he pursued them, and then God did amazing, miraculous things. The Israelites were rescued once again. And we pick up the story this week while they're in the wilderness. They're in a new situation. They have to trust in God. They've seen some amazing things, so you'd think, yeah, if anyone's going to trust in God, it's these people who have had such personal, close interactions with this amazing, miraculous God. But what we're going to see is not necessarily. Sometimes we tell ourselves, man, if I could just walk and talk, with Jesus, like the disciples did. Or, oh man, if I was there, my feet touching the dry land, crossing the Red Sea, my faith would be so much stronger. We're going to see today, not necessarily true. Uh, all of us walk by faith, and that's, that's something that we have to learn together. But last week, we talked about how there's this call to remind ourselves that God is at work, even if we don't see it. And we have this tendency to want to control things in our lives. Nod uh, subtly if you're like, yeah, I, I, I do that sometimes. We want to control the people in our lives. We want to control all the circumstances and calendar events and, and timetables. And I'm right there with you because uh, that's something that I struggle with. It's this reminder to say, yeah, we're going to do our part, but God is doing way more. God is at work, and we sometimes don't see it. We don't stop to acknowledge it. So as we begin this morning, I'm going to ask for a little bit of uh, congregational participation. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you think of a time in your life where during that time or after that time you look back and said, you know what?
God was definitely at work. Whether you saw it right away or you reflected on it later. When I ask that question, what comes to mind? And I want, just for a few moments right now, um, not just something that you think about. I would love for someone to raise their hand. Uh, and for the sake of time, don't tell us the whole story, although I'm sure there's a, there's a wonderful, amazing testimony of God's faithfulness within the long version of that story. Let me hear like the one sentence version. So if something comes to mind, I would love for you to share that with all of us right now. Dave and Tish both raised their hands. I wonder if it's the same story. Tish, what, what comes to mind? Ask God for help, and he answers. That's awesome. Dave, what were you going to say? God intervened with patience in a confrontational situation. Ah, and you befriended this person who wanted to attack you. I can't wait to hear the long version of that story. Maybe Wednesday night. A dinner in Devo. Uh, what else comes to mind? What's some, some stories of God's, how God was faithful in your life? Rick. I was out of work for quite a while. I was fired from a previous job, which I loved. It was my fault. And I went online and I found out that I was going to be out of work. Ah, so I was out of work. I'm, I'm, I'm repeating these for the sake of the people online and for the recording. But you were out of work, prayed, and God provided way faster than you thought. Amazing. This side is winning so far. Who from this side uh, has a story they're willing to share? What comes to mind when I say a time when God was faithful? I, I see your hand, but I want to nudge these people a little bit. They're, they're relying on our, our talkative left side of the house. Anyone? Roger. Decision to become baptized. God was involved in that. God showed up and was faithful. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Wade and then Dan. <laughs> wow. Praise God. If you weren't able to hear that, it's hard to summarize, but I'm going to say at a low point, God showed up. It sounds like one of those coincidences that you go, that wasn't a coincidence. Way more than what we expected. Dan the man. Hmm. When he was at the end of his robe, God said, I'm not done with you yet. Go to the chapter in the story. Rod? <laughs> when his wife moved from Oklahoma to Grayton, California, and he met her in the fourth grade. We're like, it's got to be God. It's not me. God, not Rod. That's awesome. I love these stories. Anybody, last call for, for a quick story of how God's been faithful. Darren. Darren's health way down, Jesus said. No more of this. He's here today. Oh my goodness. Evie. Ah. 
How many of you were you here? How many of you were here that day when Roger came up and said, "I'm standing by the grace of God." Spinal cord injury. Uh, we were praying hard and didn't know what was going to happen, but stood up here, led our prayer. Wow, this is awesome. Karen, you get the last story. around her heart and we were to repair it and she's here today. I don't think we're, we're glad that you're here too. You guys, you probably would be okay if this was the whole sermon time this morning. Swapping stories, talking about ways that we've seen God at work, years past, in recent times, all sorts of different situations, but just coming to this realization that man, God was with us. God was faithful pattern developing here that seems to be his character his nature the god who cares who loves who's there uh the reason i wanted to start with this is because that's kind of what you get in exodus chapter 18. the israelites made it through the red sea they're out in the wilderness several things happen and then moses's father-in-law shows up when your father-in-law shows up you want to make a good impression and say hey i've done a good job and um moses had a lot of stories to tell. In Exodus chapter 18, it says this, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wives, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, coming to you with your wife and your two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses and his father, or Moses told his father-in-law everything. Blah, 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 blah. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they had met along the way, and how the Lord had saved them. He had lots of stories to tell, lots of things to brag on God for what he had done. This kind of reminds me of when I was younger, when my grandparents were still alive. Whenever we would travel to where they lived. The first thing that we would get to do, and this was my favorite part of the visit, you'd come in the door and they'd sit you down in the sitting room. Before there was any food served, before any like games were played or uh, yard work to be helped with, it was sit down in the sitting room, tell me how you've been, how has life been, tell me stories from your life. And we'd hear stories about how they were doing, and it was just this wonderful time to sit and share stories. That's kind of what you get when Jethro shows up. Moses brings him up to speed. Tell me what you've been up to. And I'm sure that Moses told Jethro about the showdown between Yahweh and Pharaoh back in Egypt. And I'm sure he told him about this amazing escape that the Israelites were able to make from the Egyptian armies and the crossing of the Red Sea. And he fills him in on more stories of what has happened since then. And now this is where we're going to jump back in Exodus is what you get in chapters 15 through 18 are just some, some snapshots, some stories of God's faithfulness while the Israelites are in the wilderness. I'm sure Moses told Jethro about the time when God led them to find fresh water in a place where there wasn't any. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Kind of nice. You're in the hot desert. There's no water. God says, well, this water's not fit to drink, but I'm going to show you how you can drink it. The Lord provides. This snapshot reminds us that sometimes the Lord intervenes in spectacular, miraculous, unmistakable ways, and sometimes God just leads us to the things that are around us that will help us, uncovers and reveals things that were previously unknown to us, but maybe were there all along. 
Maybe we can relate to those different kinds of God's involvement in our own lives. And Moses tells him that story. And he also tells his father-in-law about the manna and the quail that God provided in the wilderness. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Uh Uh-oh. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Well, there we sat around pots of meat, and we ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Not a very good review for Moses. Remember we said last week, when people get hungry, when people get scared, they get cranky. They get snarky. It's understandable. Not cool, though, but uh, we can we get it. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And that evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. In this section, I'm reminded that grumbling is kind of like a native language for the Israelites. Like They just do a lot of grumbling. They seem like they're getting pretty good at it. But you notice, too, they start to romanticize their slave life back in Egypt. Well, at least in Egypt, we knew what the problem was. We knew where to find meat. Here, we're just kind of flying blind, and you're asking us to trust this God that is new to us. Their misguided mindset is kind of an example of the classic Old English proverb, better the devil you know than the angel you don't, which maybe is not the best philosophy. But some of us live that way. It's much more of a stretch to step out in faith into the unknown than to just stay where things aren't great. They're not great, but at least we know how to manage. We know how to get by. That's the mindset that the Israelites were struggling with during this time in the wilderness. And God hears their concerns. He hears their grumblings. And he says, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to give you bread, this strange flaky substance that they call manna. And if you go on YouTube and look up manna, you can see that like this is a phenomenon that still happens in this this part of the world today. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I'd love to show it to you, but we don't have time. Go and check it out on your own. God provides them bread and meat, and it satisfies them. And as you read the story more closely, you see it's just the right amount. God says, don't gather food on the Sabbath. Gather extra on Friday. But on the Sabbath, like, that's a day of rest. You shouldn't have to gather. And the people who try to save more find out that it spoils. And the people who don't have enough are provided for. This amazing story that he tells Jethro. God was faithful. God, once again, provides. And as this catch-up session continues between Moses and Jethro. Moses tells his father-in-law about the time that God provided water from the rock. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, a coincidental name but not uh, inappropriate, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim where there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? The people were thirsty for water there. And they, guess what, grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? And Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. And I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for all the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Interesting little side note here. The staff that... God tells Moses to use to make the water uh, drinkable is the same staff that he used to strike the Nile River back in Egypt to make the water undrinkable. So this, we see in some of these stories, it's kind of a reversal of what the plagues did 
in Egypt. The water, in this instance, became undrinkable. God says, use the same staff. I'm going to provide water from the rock. I'm going to nourish you and make the water something you can drink. The language that talks about the hail is one of the ten plagues that rained down on Egypt. It's the same word that's used to describe how bread now rains down on God's people from heaven. The locusts, from the plague of locusts, they came up, this is the language used there, came up and then covered Egypt, which destroyed their food supplies. They're, this is now replaced with quail that comes up and covers the camp, providing food for God's people. These stories are told in such an uh, interesting and memorable way. These were stories worth holding on to. These were important stories to swap for the Israelite people. And finally, Moses tells Jethro about Israel's battle with this nomadic, marauding people called the Amalekites. The Amalekites came up and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. This is an interesting detail. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him. And he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Isn't that a cool story? Wouldn't you have remembered the detail? Can't you just see Moses there going, all right, we, we figured out, for whatever reason, when my hands are up, we're winning. Maybe it was that the armies could see the staff of God that he used to guide Moses with the, the Nile striking, and then the water from the rock. Like This is a reminder that God is with you. Maybe that boosted their morale and they fought harder. Or maybe there was some kind of supernatural intervention. Like Whatever reason, like up means victory and down means uh, we're not doing so great. So you can just picture uh, uh, Aaron and her on both sides. Moses is like, ah, this battle's getting kind of long. I'm getting a little bit tired here. They're like, no, 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 we'll hold up your arms. We'll hold up your arms for you. You can just kind of see them there. It's like a weekend at Bernie's situation with these two guys supporting this one guy in the middle, and they put the stone down. It's these kinds of details in the stories are part of what reminds us of them. Like when Roger hurt his back, what I remember is that he walked up here, and he, he held up his arms, and he was like, look, hey, this is, I'm, I'm just a visual testament to God's faithfulness among us. We all celebrate it. This is one of those stories with a detail that gets preserved because it reminds us of God's faithfulness in our lives. Whatever the case, whatever the reason for the staff or God's intervention, God once again protected his people and he gives them a victory. So Moses tells Jethro all of these stories. He's glad because he gets to give his father-in-law a good report. Hey, we're still here. We're still alive. God's been faithful. And this is where we're going with this. This is what I want you to hold on to. Jethro's response after Moses tells him about all that God has done. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. And he said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. And then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. Pay attention to Jethro's response to these testimonies of God's faithfulness. He hears, and he believes, and he worships. Moses is simply just sharing stories of what's been going on in his life. They naturally and they automatically have to do with God's intervention, because Moses has hitched his wagon to Yahweh. So it's like when Lisa and I got married. Like, I used to go and sit down in my grandparents' sitting room. They'd say, how's life? And I'd tell them about you know, my job or college or how things are going. Once Lisa came into the picture, almost all of my stories have to do with Jacob and Lisa together because I hitched my wagon to the Lisa Merritt train. It was a good decision, Rod, right? You make good decisions when you're young, uh, carries you through. 
Moses has hitched his wagon to Yahweh, so to speak. So he's just saying, like, we're going to have water. Then we did, because of God. We had this battle. These people attacked us. We didn't know what to do. But God was faithful. He gave us victory. And Jethro becomes a believer in Moses' God. He worships. He brings a burnt offering. He makes a sacrifice on the spot. It seems like Jethro also wants to hitch his wagon to Yahweh. What does this have to do with us? Maybe you're a few steps ahead of me and you know where this is going. We tell people what's going on in our lives all the time. This is going to come up ten times a week. How's, how are things going? What have you been up to? We haven't caught up. Tell me some stories from your life. And as believers, as followers of Jesus, we naturally and automatically tell them about how Christ has been at work in our lives, in our relationship, how he's been changing my heart toward so-and-so, how I'm in this difficult situation, but I have this faith, that just this peace that seems to pass any understanding. I should be way more stressed out right now, but I'm standing on the promises. I'm trusting in Christ. I'm remembering how faithful he's been, and I'm trusting that he'll continue to be faithful. We tell the stories like the ones that we just told this morning. We recount the Lord's faithfulness in our lives, and it becomes this form of evangelism. It is our testimony, and it can have a powerful effect on people in the same way that Moses' stories had a powerful effect on Jethro. Who knows what Jethro believed beforehand, or what gods he worshipped or trusted, but he hears about Yahweh, and he says, oh, clearly, that's a God who saves. That's a God who is strong. That's a God who is faithful. I want him. It's a good testimony. It's a good way to open up the door and say, I follow Jesus. He's so faithful. His love is so great and so amazing. And there's plenty for you as well. People might come around when they just hear about our faith and trust in Christ. So sharing the stories of God's faithfulness uh, is a form of evangelism. But it does something else. It also reminds us of what we believe. Going back to the Israelites and their griping, like all the grumbling and the complaining that they did, you might just wonder, like, what was their problem? Why do they have to catastrophize everything? Didn't they see the power of God demonstrated again and again and again? Why didn't they yet trust God? There's lots of answers for that question, right? One, they probably had PTSD. They'd been through a lot. They're probably just traumatized. Two, they're scared and hungry and cranky, and we saw that. We get that. Fine. We'll give them a pass up to a certain point. But here's something else to notice. They had very limited experience with God at that point. Trust in any relationship is built over time with consistency, and they just don't have a very long history with Yahweh yet. Some scholars who study this, this time, this, this experience of the Israelites, they call the wandering years in the wilderness Israel's adolescence. They're still developing. They're still growing. They're still figuring out what's what and who they can trust. They're still learning how to be in relationship with God. And that reminds us that having experience leads us to a calm and wise response in any of life situations rather than a fear-driven, reactionary response. Does that make sense? I was thinking about this, and it reminded me of a, a time when I was here in my office. My office is just on the other side of this wall. I was meeting with Rod Davis. We were catching up. How are things going? Sharing what God has been doing in our lives, making time to pray together. And this is a true story. This was a few years back. There was an earthquake. You remember this? Rod was sitting on my couch. I was sitting in my office chair, and like, an earthquake happens. It was like a, a low four, mid four, or something like that. So it wasn't a huge deal, but like, things start shaking, and I go, oh, and I jump up, and I run, and I stand in the doorway, and then after a couple of beeps, I go, I hope he's okay. <laughs> like, what did Rod do? He didn't move a muscle. Rod sat on the couch just like he was, you know, didn't last for just a couple seconds. I was like, whoa. I was like, how come you didn't move? And Rod says, it wasn't a really big one. Rod has lived in California a long time. Rod knows what a big earthquake feels like. He knows what a little earthquake feels like. He has experience, so he didn't panic. I thought it was the end of the world, and uh, I was ready to save myself. Uh, our experience with God reminds us. Telling stories reminds us of the experience that we and others have had with God. It reminds us that God is involved. It reminds us that God is faithful. 
It points out that there's more to just to what's going on in any situation than just what our eyes can see or our feelings can tell our brains to do. And like I said, our experience reminds us that we walk by faith and not by sight. So when we swap stories about what God has been doing in our lives, we remind ourselves of God's involvement and we give others a chance to hear about the God that we worship and that we serve as well. Like I said, when your father-in-law comes into town, you want to give a good report. You want things to be good, and Moses was able to do that. Moses had some good news to share. Uh, We're alive, and we're not dead. We're fed and watered because of God. His good news was the good God who had saved his people. Our good news is the news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has saved us. His perfect life, his death on the cross, the empty tomb, the hope of eternal life that we have in him. That is our good news to share. I had a dream the week after Easter. Uh, I, in my dream, I stood up to preach, but I'd forgotten my notes. You guys may have seen these before. They're, they're, this is what determines how long the sermon is going to be. Sometimes it's a big stack, sometimes it's short. It's usually a big stack. I can't get very far without my sermon notes. It's got all my scriptures on it. It's got the slide cues. It's got, it's say this next. You, you may have noticed I have a, a, I'm pretty reliant on my script. But in my dream, I'd forgotten it somewhere else. So I got up there and I went, oh, there's no script. And I went, uh, so I opened my mouth and I said, Christ is risen. And everybody started cheering. Everybody was celebrating. Everybody was clapping. They were laughing and whooping and high-fiving. And it was like, yeah, yeah. And I went, okay, I'm off to a good start here. And I waited for the, the cheering and the celebration to die down so I could, you know, fake my way through. 30-minute talk. Uh, but it didn't die down. People just kept cheering. It just it, They were so excited by that message. And I went, okay, that's it. I'm, I left. And I went and I sat down. And it was the best sermon that I ever preached. Amen. <laughs> but it's a reminder that that's our good news. Christ is risen. That's the good news that we have to share. Sometimes that's all it takes to tell people what God has been doing in our lives. We we believe in the empty tomb. We believe in the power of God. We believe in the God who rescued the Israelites. On and on and on. I'm almost at the end of my script. There's nothing left after this line, so uh, I better wrap it up. Two things I want to challenge you guys to do this week, though. This is your homework of sorts. One, as you swap stories with people, when they inevitably ask you, what's going on in your life? Make an intentional move to attribute victories, successes, hope. Attribute those to God. Sometimes we say, oh, thank God for for this. Or, oh, this really, this, you know, Leah was in the hospital, but thank God he rescued her. I mean that. Or sometimes I say, praise God for this. It's a small change. Side story. I was uh, at a comedy club, and I saw a stand-up comic, and he was doing a joke, but the premise to the joke had something where he said, instead of saying, thank God, he said, praise God. And I noticed that. And I was like, I bet he's a believer. That's what believers talk about. Not just this general like, oh, thank the universe. Oh, thankfully this thing happened. No, no, no. We, we had kind of identify ourselves by saying God was faithful in this situation. Jesus was at work. I could tell it. I have no doubt in my mind. So that's challenge number one. Be intentional about your language. If you're a follower of Jesus, say like, Christ changed my heart. Or what's going on in your life? This is what's going on, and God is at work, and I can tell. We don't always talk like this, especially when we're not having conversations with people we we don't know whether or not they believe. We sort of just keep it generic. Try that. Try that. See what happens. The second thing is like the first thing. Second challenge is invite someone who you know is a believer when you ask them what's been going on in your life, ask them in a way that invites them to glorify God. Instead of just saying, what do you got coming up this week? Or how has life been? Say, what has God been doing in your life lately? Give them a chance to glorify God, and you can both can celebrate God's work in your lives together. It's a simple thing, right? Maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't, but those are the two things I want to encourage you to do with this in mind. Do what Moses did, just naturally in a conversation. Give glory to God and see what happens. God can do a lot with our little. Let's pray together.
Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you that we could stay in this building all day long and share stories about hard times you've brought us through, hope you've given us in Christ, the way you've transformed our hearts and our relationships, the wisdom that you have given us because we've opened up our ears to receive it. Thank you for being a God who is faithful. My prayer for this congregation and for all believers is that we don't keep these stories to ourselves, that we don't forget that you are a God who loves us, a God who sees us, and you are the God who saves. Let us lean into that reality. Let us be quick to share that. Open up doors for us to be able to give you glory and give you credit for the good works you're doing. And the people that we share them with, we pray that you will cultivate their hearts to receive this message, these seeds that we plant, one story at a time. We love you and we praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. Try and hold this closer. God is good. To all those who are online and attending with us, welcome. We're glad you're here. I want to let you guys know that my follow-up appointment with my surgeon went well. Uh, I got my Dairy strip out. Looks like somebody sliced my neck, but that's what actually happened, so I guess that's why it looks that way. But they did a really good job. And uh, when I let all my chins show, you can't actually see the, the line, so that's a good thing. Laura Ranieri has asked for prayers uh, for her Aunt Ray, who's in her 80s and fell on 18th of April, breaking two ribs back. She's in tremendous pain, so pray for her and her uncle, who also needs prayers as he cares for her. We ask you to continue to pray for Joseph. He, um, you know, he has this, this stress fracture on his leg. And pray for divine insight for his doctors as they look at what's going on, if there is any kind of underlying issue there. Continue to pray for Wade and Sylvia Skinner. So glad you're here today, Wade. And Sylvia's mother had surgery last week, right? She doing okay? Okay. For those of you who didn't hear that, there's a few complications. She hopes to start dialysis soon, so she's getting there. Boy, I understand about the complications. Man, those can be tough. Please continue to pray for Phil's parents. Uh, his mom will be in a rehabilitation center for perhaps another month. Pray for her recovery and his dad's ability to take care of himself and her. Uh, Sandra's mom, Brenda Crow, who's hopefully worshiping with us online. Hi, Brenda. She had knee replacement surgery uh, fairly recently, still struggling, managing a lot of pain, weakness. Please pray for her healing, especially so that God's comfort will envelop her and the peace of God will rest on her. And for Sandra's brother, Richie, he continues to just deteriorate and still not getting the help that he needs. Please pray that he's able to get that disability so that he can start receiving the medical care and attention that he really needs. Of course, prayers for Billy Hunt and Rosemary. Continue to pray for you after your fall. Continue to prayers for Kathy Goldstein's friends, Deborah and Bill. Bill's just still recovering from his surgery and a couple of weeks ago now that he had a malignant tumor removed. Pray for that. And Jan and Al, of course, 
Pray for them in this difficult season. And just a reminder, I mentioned it last week, but just a reminder again, uh, talk to Jan before visiting him. He would appreciate that. And prayers for all of us who have lost loved ones. Um, yeah, that's tough. Especially if the loved one is really close, uh, that can be really hard. As Jacob said, our prayers can sometimes focus more on our needs, right, than on God's trustworthy love and amazing power to heal. God listens to us. He listens. Sometimes his answer is no, but he's always listening. I know that I can get that a little confused in my brain sometimes. I'm like, if you're not agreeing with me, then you're not listening to me. You didn't listen to me. You went ahead and did what you said you were going to do. Well, Aaron, remember, listening does not equal agreement. Sometimes I need to remember that. Maybe we all do. But God always hears us. So let's pray together as a group. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your healing mercies. We thank you for your care, your attention, the fact that you listen to us and hear us, and that it matters to you. It matters to you, the God of the universe, who has ultimate power at your disposal. You choose to use that power to hear us in our situations. Because what matters to us matters to you. Lord, you know what we need. All these situations that we've talked about, they're varied, but they all have a single theme in common, and that is you. We're calling on you to be in it and through it and around it and to help it to conform to your will. We pray, Lord, that you help us who are in these situations to release our fears to you. Let you take those fears and replace it with your strength and your love. And the peace that comes from being in you and abiding in you. We ask you, Lord, to guide our decisions so when we are making choices in our life, they align to your will for us. We trust you, Lord. We have faith in you. But like that man in the Bible who said, I believe. Lord, help my unbelief. Sometimes we can use more faith, more trust, that you are the one who is all-powerful and all-loving. Lord, we pray that you bring us closer to you through these things and to each other. And help us to remember your blessings, your moments with us in the desert when you gave us manna to eat, your moments when you parted our own red seas of the things that were such a blocker to us. Help us be still and know that you are God and we are not. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to remind you as we close with a final scripture from Psalms 68, verse 19. Oh, where's Marie? Benevolence tomorrow. Oh. Every, every woman Marie dish. Good, good stuff. <laughs> if a man shows up, they don't need to bring a dish. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing. There you go. There you should share. That's good. Psalm 68, verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens. God is our salvation. Go in peace.